He emphasized grace so much, but he was not shy about working. He worked his butt off to bring the gospel. He even said boldly in 1 Corinthians 15, he worked more than any other apostle. Paul is a great example to us. I mean, the Lord Jesus had to get away because he was exhausted <laughs> spending time with people. Really, even the Protestants who would talk the most eloquently about salvation by faith alone, they worked, to use your language, <laughs> their butts off. So welcome back to Footnotes with Dr. Tony Caffey. I'm Adam Casalino, and with me, as always, is our pastor, Pastor Tony. It's good to see you, Tony. Proverbs 12, huh, Adam? That's right. So your sermon was in praise of words and work. So what is that all about? Are we Protestants? Should we, we hate work? No, we have a Protestant work ethic, which we believe right. in. And yes, salvation by works, that's a problem. Yeah. So the New Testament has a lot to say about mm -hmm. why that's um, theologically wrongheaded. But in terms of work... The, the labor, the industriousness of somebody who knows God, fears God, loves God, that's all over the Old Testament. That's in the New Testament as yeah. well. Paul said, if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. That wasn't John Smith and the first <laughs> settlers in America yeah. initially that said that. That was, um, that was the Apostle Paul. That's right. So we were looking at Proverbs 12, and I noticed you did kind of an interesting grouping. Um, Clumping. Clumping, because we've talked about that in the past, like how are you going to organize these Proverbs? And you kind of took a few passages and grouped them together based on they're obviously themed. Yeah. And your message was in praise of words and work. And you know, speaking of Paul, you know, he was the apostle to the Gentiles. He, he emphasized grace so much, but he was not shy about working. He worked his butt off to yeah. bring the gospel. He even Dude. said boldly in 1 Corinthians 15, he worked more than any other apostle. Uh, so the idea that in Christ we just kind of sit around and do nothing is completely alien from what Scripture says. And yeah, so we can preach that and emphasize that as we're working through the book of Proverbs. There there are those meta narrative moments where we've got to help people understand, though, mm -hmm. that this is not, uh, you know, to be saved or in order to earn God's favor. It's on the backside of yep. that. So and we've talked about that as well, reading Proverbs backwards from the perspective of the cross. So having that mindset, I think if you do have that mindset right, you can preach this, you can embrace it, you can really uh, hammer away at it as well in terms of an, an ethic that mm -hmm. we're living by. And thanks for that. Yeah, uh, the, Paul is a great example to us. I mean, the Lord Jesus had to get away because he was exhausted <laughs> <and> spending <laughs> time with people. Mm -hmm. um, that's normative for uh, a Christian, really, even the Protestants who, you know, would talk the most eloquently about salvation by faith alone, mm -hmm. they worked, to use your language, <laughs> their butts off. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther and John Calvin and others, they would write, they would preach, they would lead, they would minister. Yep. And in some cases, they would die early because they mm -hmm. were working so hard. That's right. So you kind of framed all this uh, with the idea of love. We're motivated by love, and we love what God loves, we hate what God hates. In your first point, you said those who love God love instruction. And, you know, verse 1 says those who love discipline love knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. And I noticed the, the, the church laughed when we were moving through that because the ESV uses stupid, which is such a strong word, but you explain it's an appropriate word for that. Yeah, the word in Hebrew is ba'ar, and some would see in that an onomatopoeia, meaning a, a word that sounds like what it is. So mm. you can imagine a cattle even lowing, brrr, you know, <laughs> um, but it, and it is used in other places for kind of an animalistic instinct or mm. kind of a, a dunderheadedness for somebody who's animal-like. So rare word. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's a strong word, but Solomon uses some strong language yeah. elsewhere here. He's speaking of the fool, speaking of the the uh, nitwit. I'm trying to think of the exact for the petit, the person who is simple minded. Mm. So uh, he's he's communicating in such a way where we see how unpleasing it is to the Lord, how absent fear of the Lord. Re resides in somebody who's just blissfully ignorant about everything, and mm -hmm. let's just celebrate our status as an ignoramus. Yeah. Solomon's not having that. Yeah, you had an interesting footnote 
um, from Longman's commentary that he says, you know, Solomon knows that mistakes provide opportunities for learning yep. and that everyone makes mistakes, but what we can't tolerate is an attitude of defensiveness that refuses to make mistakes. And that doesn't just put me in mind of like the the naive, ignorant person who just knows nothing, but even people who might know a lot, but have this idea where I, you can't tell me what to do. I know enough. I'm not yes. going to, you know, I've done this a long time, that kind of attitude. So my favorite word for this, which I've used a lot in this series, is teachability mm. or teachableness. And that that's a mindset. Yeah. That's a desire. At whatever stage you're at, even if you are in a stage of learning where you're young and you're, you are ignorant, you are petite, like, okay, okay like we can work with that if you're teachable. Mm. Uh, and what you said is on the other end of that, somebody who maybe has a lot of experience and been around the block, they they know a thing or two, but they're they're so what's the word, incalcitrant, and mm -hmm. what they believe and know, they're like, I'm done learning, I'm done hearing from anybody else, I'm just set in my ways, and that's not good either. So this, this spirit of teachability. So I mentioned this on Sunday, the New Testament word is disciple, mm -hmm. and I don't want to <laughs> emphasize that word, because mm -hmm. we're learners, yeah. and you know, people gathered around Jesus to learn and to grow and to mature, and, and you can just watch the disciples throughout the New Testament the, the way they are increasing and learning day by day. And, mm. and there are times when they are, you know, I don't know if I want to use the word stupid, but, you know, Jesus rebukes them repeatedly yeah. for being dull when they should sense things. But then they elevate and they elevate and they elevate. And then the Holy Spirit gets poured out at Pentecost and it's like they get supercharged. Mm -hmm. And now they're the ones out there not, you know, without mistakes. Even Peter makes mistakes after yeah. Pentecost. He gets rebuked by the Apostle Paul. But man, they are capable and leading mm -hmm. and maturing, and and that's the goal. Not that all of us would be capital A apostles, I don't believe in that, but that we have that discipleship trajectory. We're learning, we're growing, we're following Jesus, we're becoming more like Jesus. That's where Christianity, to be honest, Adam gets fun. Yeah. Where it's like, wow, you know, the Lord has taken me to a place I didn't, I didn't think I could get to on my own, and wow, look how much I've matured. And once you get a taste for that, you want more of that. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's such a powerful incentive. Like the example you use of these disciples, we see them in the Gospels and they seem like knuckleheads. <laughs> but then eventually in time, in the book of Acts and the rest of the scriptures, you see God using them in such an amazing way. Yep. And it's a good it's a good incentive and maybe even a good warning for folks because not to hammer it too hard, like I've known people who've refused to accept instruction. Mm -hmm. And it became like a lifestyle of saying, no, 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 don't tell me what to do. And it deprived them of opportunities. It wasn't just, oh, I, I'm, you know, I don't want to be bothered being told what to do. But eventually it meant that they lacked opportunity to teach others, opportunities to grow, opportunities to serve in, in like you said, fun, exciting ways as mm -hmm. they aged or whatever. So it's it's something to take to heart. Um, you know, even at my age, I feel like there's times where I don't want to receive instruction from you. Who are you? But I have more to learn. I have way more to learn. And that's a good thing. Doesn't it, like I think part of it's like, if I accept your instruction, that means I don't know anything. Well, that's not true. It means you have more to learn. Can I uh, get on a hobby horse right now? Sure. Would that be okay? Yeah. Um, one of the difficulties in this modern day world as well is information overload. Mm. So we got information coming from everybody. So even if you do have a teachable mindset, mm. one of the most important skills for a 21st century person is you've got to decipher, in yeah. some cases quickly, mm. like who's trustworthy and who should I be listening to and which, I mean, which which YouTube channels should <laughs> I delete and which one should I, should I check in on? Mm -hmm. And that's that's tough. I think that's one of the reasons why you want to pick a good church that's teaching the Bible, that has sound doctrine, because that's going to be the primary place where you're you're growing and learning. And and uh, um, and and I I'll add to that as well. Like let that be the dominant force in your learning, mm. your your small groups, your yeah. your receiving of God's word um, on Sunday morning, your your own personal Bible study as well. Don't don't let everything you say or, or everything that you learn be 
coming from some outside YouTube channel from some guru out there. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if that's helpful and it, because, you know, I feel like I'm arguing against what we're doing right here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm don't taking, delete this channel. <laughs> Keep this one. Yeah. I'm, I'm taking an ax to my own tree here. <laughs> but I mean, there is, there is a sense in which I see young people sometimes they gravitate towards what this guy says is this guy and that guy and this guy and this guy is like, okay, well, why don't you calm down, mm -hmm. turn the YouTube channels off if you need to, read your Bible, go to church, learn and grow in that way, mm -hmm. and pipe into those trustworthy sources. And then I think you have better discernment to, let's just say, eat the fish and spit out the bones with some of that other content. Absolutely. So your second point, uh, as you grouped it up, was, you know, um, someone who loves God loves good words. And once again, Solomon's going back to the tongue. Mm. And it, it's so striking that so much of Proverbs, of the book of wisdom, the book of righteous, godly wisdom goes back to our words. Do you think Solomon was an introvert? <laughs> Did <laughs> I ask that not. question? No. I wonder if he was just surrounded by extroverts and this was like his mea culpa. <laughs> Don't like, talk. <laughs> yeah. But it's amazing because, you know, we see that, of course, like we said in James in the past, but... It's just as relevant today as it was back then. You know, like you said, social media yeah. and this deluge of noise and talking and everyone has an opinion and everyone thinks they have the right opinion. And Proverbs keeps going back to guard your tongue, guard yeah. what you say. You know, don't always share what you think, but then sometimes share what you think, you know. And it's, it's a powerful reminder for everyone because I'm introverted but I get in trouble with what I say all the time. Yeah. So we all need to learn this. So discernment goes two directions, mm -hmm. what goes in and then what goes out. Yeah. So that's key is we need to discern, like I just said a second ago with my soapbox, like wh what are the voices in our head? Who are the people communicating to mm -hmm. us? But then there's discernment, and this, this is so uh, well connected to Jesus's words about from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. There's something inside of us that wants to be angry. There's something inside of us that wants to lash out. There's something inside of us that wants to just <laughs> talk incessantly about things that are unimportant or that are self-focused when, you know, we're driving another person bonkers because <laughs> it's like, so it's almost like narcissistic how much we're talking about ourselves. Mm -hmm. It's, it's an ugly thing. Um, to, to diagnose, discern, um, there, there's joy in this too as well, where we can start to taper down the, the words that we constantly want to speak. We start to be more selective about who we say things to and what we say and how we frame it even, you know, instead of uh, lashing out like sword thrusts later, mm -hmm. you know, where we're like <laughs> stabbing people. Yep. We're we're using our words as uh, a potential place of healing to help and to encourage. Not that it doesn't cut, but it cuts differently mm -hmm. in a way that would help. So um, that takes that takes discernment, time, maturity. I think too, Adam, you learn from others. Like I, I had this elder in my previous church. A couple of them, they were introverts, and they would just not speak until the moment was right. And mm -hmm. and it seemed like every time they said something, it was like, that's it. Yeah. That's what we've been waiting for. It's almost like they they knew to cook their meat a little bit longer <laughs> before they presented it to us. Yeah. And it's like that is perfectly mm -hmm. seasoned. So um yeah, God help us with these yeah. things. And speaking with the idea of a tongue being like a sword, it <laughs> puts me in mind there's a plant called the mother in law tongue. What? And really? it's it's a very popular plant, like a Venus vitra, uh, flytrap. Plant? No, it it the the blades look like long, sharp swords. It's also called a snake plant because it kind of looks like snakes. Okay. And so it's a very hardy plant. It's a desert plant. Okay. It's very hard to kill, which is kind of ironic. <laughs> um, but it's a very popular plant because, ironically, it's also very beneficial. Uh, NASA did a study years ago about plants that can purify the air in offices, and top of the list was the mother-in-law plant because it pulls in all the toxins from like carbon dioxide and then puts out oxygen. So it's this great plant. It's ironic because it's named after sharp-tongued mother-in-laws, but it, if you put it in your house, it could actually help freshen the air of your house. I actually have quite a few because they're very easy to take care of. You just give it a little bit of water and they look great. And it's this, it's to me a powerful image of the tongue. 
it could be sharp like a sword, like a snake, but used in the right way can be life-giving. What a great analogy. Yeah. And then when your mother-in-law comes over, you can say, <laughs> I named these plants after yeah. you because I love you so much. Yeah, look at that. Um, <laughs> so speaking of marriage, uh, there's this great verse, almost like a, a teaser for the future chapters. Yeah. Um, An excellent wife is a crown for her husband, of her husband. And you said something really amazing I wanted to talk about a little bit was that the word for sh- excellent could also mean power and strength yeah. and how you said there were no dainty women mm. in ancient Israel. Um, dainty and obsequious, I mm. would add those two together. I got that really from John Piper, and he was talking about, okay, when men make mistakes, they err in two directions. Mm-hmm. They either get... Um, you know, really passive and uh, emasculated, mm. or they get gruff and macho and, and obnoxious on the other side of it. So he was processing that in terms of like, okay, how do women err? Mm. Well, women err, I think probably the, f- the first way we would think is they, they get domineering or they, mm. they uh, fail to really follow the leadership of their husband. Uh, on the other side of that is what he called obsequiousness where <laughs> it's like the the Victorian woman who drops the handkerchief and she's like Ooh, and she's <laughs> she's quiet and uh and passive and um what what's the word I'm looking for I, I feel like I'm walking through a mine minefield <laughs> right now talking about this but but just not strong like we don't mm-hmm. think of women sometimes uh, rightfully as, as strong the word in Hebrew is chayil mm-hmm. and so and the woman who's described that way in, in the Hebrew Bible, Ruth follows Proverbs, and so you have Proverbs 31, then you go right to Ruth, yeah. and Ruth is described as chayil, and she's out in the <laughs> fields, you know, picking up barley, wasn't it, and, and mm-hmm. carrying it, and she she captures Boaz's attention because she's a hardworking woman, and yeah. she she leaves Moab to go with her mother-in-law out into, you know... Um, a, a foreign land. I mean, Ruth is she's strong, and yet at the same time, she's not lacking feminine characteristics yeah. either. So there is a femininity that is strong, mm-hmm. and there's there's a femininity that is strong in ways that men can't be feminine and can't be strong like that. Yeah. And I want to emphasize that, and I want to capture that, mm-hmm. and I want to celebrate that among women instead of you know the Glory Steinem thing where hmm. it's like. We now have become the men that we always wanted to marry. Like, that's yeah. not good. And then the other side of it was like, well, let's be just so uh, so obsequious, so so wimpy as women that we just let men walk all over you. Like, that's that's not true either or yeah. good or biblical. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm going to testify a little bit for my own wife, if I could. Like, there is strength in her. There mm-hmm. is a Eastern European... <laughs> Strong, I can you know care for myself, care for my son, care for my husband that that I am attracted to, and I want to mm. nurture that instead of squash that. Like, oh, that intimidates me because I got to be the man <laughs> of the house. Well, you know, get some courage, man. You know, yeah. don't be so insecure. Allow uh, a wife to be strong in the way that the Bible explains strong women. So. There we go. That I probably have said enough. Why don't you add to that or take yeah. away from that, Adam? <laughs> it, it's excellent because, we, as you said, we see in Scripture this biblical definition of strong femininity, which is so alien from what we see in the world today. As you said, you know, the feminist movement tried to address legitimate issues, you might say, in the world, but in a fleshly, carnal, ungodly way, and it created this mess. And now as Christians, we're trying to, like, in, a, in one sense, pick up the pieces as husbands, as wives, as families. What is a... St- like, women aren't weak, dainty things, like you said, but they're not men. So what does that feminine strength look like? And mm-hmm. and thankfully, in our community, we have a women's ministry where they seek to be those kinds of women. And yeah. For the young men out there, that's the kind of woman you want who's yep. strong and, and what we call self-possessing, meaning she's not, she doesn't look to other people to, to define her, but she looks to Christ, she looks to what he's done in yep. her, Good, but isn't macho and pushes you around. That's the kind of woman you want, and women, that's the kind of woman you should want to be. Um, what's ironic is like we talk about the Victorian image of women and yep. that, and... I hate to pick on the Victorians because yeah. they got some things right. There, it I was mean, a wonderful time. But like if you look at books like Jane Austen's books, yeah. they're actually 
satirizing that mindset yeah. and like they're very popular now because and they people might think well that's how it was back then but they're actually mocking that daintiness with these women who in their own time were very strong and confident and everyone was like what a woman who was strong but those books are, are trying to say women shouldn't be dainty i can't pick up my handkerchief they need to be self-possessing think for themselves and want men who respect that and, and love each other um let's argue about jane austen <laughs> Because I think Elizabeth Bennet is the perfect mm. picture of a woman who has strong, who, yeah. who is capable, and at the same time, she, in her desire and searching after a husband, she is also able to to demonstrate feminine qualities that are admirable and good and attractive to a man. Yep. Like I don't, I'm not the Jane Austen expert, but from <laughs> what I know, like. That's that's a good model. So yeah. look at me now. I'm now I'm affirming the Victorians. <laughs> what happened? The, the criticism of Victorians, which produced this better thing. I don't know. So they did have. So let's say this about the Victorians. They did have a a sexual ethic and a purity mm. uh, culture. I know that's kind of a dangerous term right now, but right. that was good. That was healthy. Parents were involved in protecting the, yeah. the purity of their children in ways that now. It's a free for all, so shame mm -hmm. on us for that. We need to be more Victorian in that regard. Yeah, yeah. Glean, like you said, eat the fish, spit out the bones. So there, I think we've established between these two men a perfect definition of <laughs> we need, femininity. <laughs> we need to get another podcast <laughs> yeah. with a, a wife the wives commenting bring, on this. Yeah, yes. they, they'd have a lot to say. Um, so as we move on, you know, like we said, you, you've kind of grouped up the the text in different categories, and the next one was loving, honest work. Can I talk about the grouping for just a moment? Absolutely. Because, you know, I did mention there's clumping, but even with that, I mean, I want to admit there is a, a hint, a sense of randomness, too. Mm. Like I see, especially with the the statements about the tongue and about work, like, okay, he's he's hitting that repeatedly with these different verses. But then every once in a while, there'll be a verse like, okay, well, how did that squeeze in there? And how does mm. this correlate? Sometimes I think the correlations are uh, repeated uses of words or the style of the antithetical parallelism. There's a pattern to it. Yeah. And so maybe as Solomon or some other person was grouping them, they saw the same word being used, and, and then there's multiple references to the tongue that they kind of clump together. So I'm still trying to figure that out, Adam, mm -hmm. and yet uh, I do see especially with that those two sections on work he's he's hammering away at that for several verses mm -hmm. verses 10 11 and 12 and then later verses 24 through 27 yeah and verse 10 stood out to me because when i first got saved and i was reading through proverbs absorbing it that verse stood out um in whatever translation i had it said like the righteous care for their animals etc but mm -hmm. ESV says, but the mercy of the wicked is cruel. And the, I think the translation I had said, the kindness, even the kindness of the wicked is cruel. And it, it was one of those verses that just stuck in my mind. And it kind of speaks to the practicality of Scripture. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm righteous in Christ. I want to model my life after Scripture. So even, even the way I treat my animals is a reflection of that. And, you know, like you've talked about it in your sermon, you know, being hum humane and kind to right. creatures. And for us, of course, we, that's ne normal when we have pets because we love our pets and we want to yep. take care of them. But even in, you know, a, a farming cattle society, yes, this animal is going to be made into food, but a righteous person cares for it even in that. And it just took out that a wicked person, the person you don't want to be, even their kindness is cruel. And there's like an irony twisted into that. And it... It kind of shook me, and you mentioned PETA, and the irony of that organization is that their kindness is cruel. Like, there are PETA yeah, shelters who we'll euthanize say. more animals than other shelters, like 75%. And it's this weird, twisted thing where they're protecting animals by killing them. And it's like, that's not helping protect animals. And even their idea of, like, you know, vegan, et cetera, it's not because they care for animals. It's this other more nefarious thing that res results in more harm. I think the cure for this is good anthropology. Mm. You need a good anthropology. Man yeah. is made in the image of God, men and women both, Genesis 1. So if you get that, like we're the only image bearers. Yeah. So I'm sorry, but the chimpanzee doesn't have legal rights <laughs> before the, the U.S. Constitution. Or, yeah. You know, there's a lot of craziness out there trying to equate 
mammals as equal or try to define even self-consciousness as maybe the mm. paradigm for what makes uh, cruelty cruel or uncruel or whatever. But no, let's go to the Bible. The Bible talks about us as human beings being the pinnacle of God's creative work, we're the image bearers, mm -hmm. and yet, Adam, this is important, we have dominion over the world. So we're called to lead and to and to to husband the mm -hmm. ground and to be involved in animal husbandry where we're caring for uh, sheep and cattle and yep. donkeys, et cetera. And there's, there's pictures of that, or at least uh, there's examples of that in the Torah. So mm -hmm. don't muzzle an, ax, an ox while he's uh, treading grain, mm -hmm. right? Is that how the phrase, is that how it goes? I think so. Um, why? Because that's cruel. For, yeah. The ox needs to be able to eat. It's funny that the ox in the New Testament, the analogy that Paul uses <laughs> is the pastor. Yeah. So, I'm the ox, so yeah, this is important go. to me. But then there's other statements about boiling a, a kid in its mother's milk, which mm -hmm. there's different views on there. There's other uh, statements about taking out, killing uh, killing a bird with the eggs that are part of the, the nest as mm -hmm. well. So you might look at that and be like, well, what's the spiritual principle <laughs> behind that? And what's the metaphor? That... Mm. Maybe it should be kind to animals, yeah. to treat them in such a way that would be humane without losing your mind in terms of uh, the pedo world yeah. where things get weird really fast. Yeah, absolutely. I think mixed in with this idea of work, he throws out this nugget of be kind to animals, and we can see that extended to what God had said at the beginning, we were to rule over them, have dominion over them, but in a way that is nurturing. You know, God put us in a garden yep. at the first. You know, we we aren't tyrants who are like, you will give me meat. You know, like we should love and care for everything, not in this weird progressive, this is our only planet way, but in the fact that God made this world. It's a wonderful world. We're here for a time. We should cherish it. We should cherish animals, nature, all of that, because... It's a part of what we are as God's children, his workers. And even in the way that we kill them and eat them, which, yeah. by the way, we can. <laughs> um, but that sh there should be a humaneness to that. Absolutely. So um, we see that even spelled out in, in the Torah. So. so in the time we have left, I want to focus on the verse towards the end where he talks about anxiety. This is okay. such a huge uh, topic in our world today to the point where some people say they have, it's just who they are. I have general anxiety, this is just who I am. Uh, but the Bible is very clear, both here and in the New Testament, that we're not meant to live in this constant state of anxiousness. Mm -hmm. And Proverbs says, you know, anxiety weighs oh, the heart down, but a good word lifts us up. So, you know, what would you say to someone who's like, uh, this is just who I am, Pastor. I have anxiety, you know, I'm taking medication, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but this is just what I'm meant to be. Like, how should we look at it from a biblical perspective? How should we deal with our anxiety? Yeah, good. This this might be a good place to point out that we did a theology, theology in Action mm -hmm. podcast on anxiety, and uh, y'all can check that out for some more specific details. I do think there is good anxiety, uh, because even the Greek word that Paul uses in Philippians, he uses for Timothy when he talks about the concern that Timothy has for the churches, mm. and then he uses that same word later in the famous passage, Philippians 4, mm. do not be anxious about anything. Mm -hmm. So there's good anxiety, like for a parent, you know, you have a young daughter, so for you to be concerned about her and to yeah. care for her and to maybe get up in the middle of the night and you have a, a little bit of sleeplessness because how are you? Are you sick? Do you need to be fed? Do you need your diaper changed? Like that's yeah. right and good. And without that, you you would be, um, in some ways, not human. You would yeah. be or negligent in mm. terms of your duties. Same thing with a pastor over a church, or you might say a political leader over a government. So there's good anxiety, um, but then that easily can become fretfulness, mm -hmm. worry. And the big issue isn't really worry, it's not trusting God, yeah. not uh, seeing God sovereign, and trusting his sovereign purposes, even if you're going through a period of difficulty or or struggle or pain. So um, your faith needs to elevate. Mm. Anxieties elevate. Your faith, your confidence yeah. in God needs to elevate. Yeah. Your prayers need to elevate, yeah. because that's the remedy, as Paul spells it out yeah. quite beautifully in Philippians. 
Uh, Shay Mounts mentioned this this last week in the announcements for our church. Mm -hmm. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Yeah. So in that way, Adam, I'll, I'll just say this. this. This is kind of a twisted way of thinking about it, but it mm -hmm. might help those who have anxiety. When your anxieties rise, that's an opportunity for you to get closer to God. Yeah. It's like somebody who might be struggling with pornography. When that temptation increases, okay, here's a chance mm. for you to get closer to God, yeah. for you to pray for some other person, for you to, to get your mind off of your sin and off of yourself and really cry out to God in need, and you're, you're about to grow. You're about to elevate. So uh, some people get anxious about being anxious, yeah. you know? Like, here, the, here comes the anxiety. What am I going to do about it? And then they just kind of freak out. Yeah. Instead of going directly or immediately to the medication or directly starting to stew on something that you're that you're really uh, worried about like okay the anxiety rises here's your opportunity take take advantage of it you're about to grow you're about to get closer mm -hmm. to God go yeah. after God and you know Philippians 4 pray it out and maybe too while you're doing that get some other folks involved mm -hmm. to pray and help you yeah. Absolutely. I think, yeah, I think that's exactly what people need to hear. Um, I'm also encouraged by what Proverbs said, a good word makes him glad. Like yep. if we know people who are struggling, whether it's general anxiety or they're going through a hard time, we have the good word. Like you said, what's the good word? We can encourage them. We pray for them, but we also can, you know, when we go through difficult times, it feels like the, everything in life is just miserable, but having someone step in and, and, and bring encouragement can can help get a person back to that place like, oh, yeah, God is with me. I could turn to him. Amen to that. Yeah. So as we wrap up chapter 12, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, so verse, verse 28, Yeah, the illusion, more than an illusion, a direct statement, yep. I would even argue, for immortality. How did mm. that hit you, Adam? Um, very encouraging. I, lo I love passages in Proverbs where it talks about you know, a path of life, or there's one Proverbs that, I forgot the reference now, but it's like, the path of the righteous is like the dawn that gets brighter and brighter to the final day, and it, it's a lot like this one, like righteousness, you know, brings life. It, it's it's this optimistic, and it's appropriate that it follows this verse on anxiety, that, you know, the path of righteousness, which we know is in Christ, brings life, brings hope. There's no fear of eternal death. It's... <clears throat> And we say it's a, there's truisms, not promises, but I think this is a promise when you have Christ. It's it's something that lifts us up, something that encourages us. I was encouraged by it too, and you know, I kind of went into the book of Proverbs saying if there is any allusion to the afterlife, it's mm -hmm. it's obscured. Mm -hmm. But there are a few moments, and I'm influenced greatly by Bruce Walkie and and the way that he approaches this. There are a few moments where the illusion is not an illusion. Yeah. It's like there will be life after life, so you better get your yeah. righteousness in order. Mm -hmm. And we know, as you just testified to, that our righteousness comes through faith in Christ. Thank you once again for being here with us. Thank you for watching uh, the full sermon, of course, and our other episodes are available on this channel. See you next time.